Hey everybody, Gary here with Pal Music. I hope you enjoyed that performance of Chris Stapleton's national anthem from the Super Bowl a few days ago at the time that I'm filming this. You might be watching this a few years from now, which wouldn't surprise me because this is an absolute instant classic, one for the history books, in my opinion. I'm feeling so inspired by it. To me, the way that Chris Stapleton performed this song and the way that it was received by the people that we saw, the football players themselves, ready to do battle on the field, and there they are crying, so many of us at home. It really just shows what music is capable of. So I'm feeling super inspired by that, which is why I decided to make this video and why this project just was a joy to make. So I use this audio extraction software called RipX, where I was able to kind of isolate the guitar. So some of the things you see, you're probably like, you know, I see those dots moving, but I don't hear that. But I was able to extract the guitar and really hear a little more clearly what was going on, you know, with the roar of the crowd and Chris's extremely powerful voice. So obviously the vocals are completely incredible, but this the title of this video is Guitar Teacher Reacts and Teaches. So I wanna speak more to the arrangement on the guitar. So we hear the national anthem in different ways. Sometimes we hear it totally a cappella. That means there's no musical accompaniment at all. It's just the voice, right? But a lot of times when we hear it with an instrument, there's a lot of chord changes. It's kind of a sophisticated arrangement. But what Chris was able to do here with his drop tuning and his fingering and, and the way that he played the, the D chord in particular, or in this case, the D flat, because he was tuned down, was create this kind of open drone feeling, a kind of peaceful simplicity. And let me tell you what I mean by a drone. So this note right here, for the majority of his arrangement, we hear this kind of ringing throughout, right? So he really stayed on this, this home chord in the key of D flat, the one chord, a lot of the time. Oh, and you now to give it more of that peaceful open feeling what he did was first of all he tuned his whole guitar down a half step to start 
so Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan, for instance, were famous for tuning everything down one half step. So that means where this is usually an E becomes an E flat, where this is usually a B becomes a B flat, G becomes a G flat, D becomes a D flat, A becomes an A flat, and then E becomes an E flat. But then what Chris did is he tuned now his E flat down a whole step to a D flat. And what that allows us to do is when we play a D chord, now it becomes a six string chord. Right, if you just play a basic D, now we have a low root note in our sixth string. So whereas D is usually this four note chord, now it's this beautiful six note chord. Now to give it a little more of an ethereal and open sound, he, instead of just holding the D like this, he went like this. Cool, right? So now, by holding it with this fingering, So that G string is the 11th, and the high E string, or E flat in this case, is the 9th. So when we start with this basic D flat major chord, which is just 1, 3, 5, but we add these couple of other colors, the 9th and 11th, we get a cool new sound. And these notes in particular, the 11th and the 9th, they have, in my opinion, this kind of ethereal quality when added to a basic triad. So what does this mean? A triad, one, three, five, a ninth, an eleventh, or a two, or a four? So just a little music theory talk right here. So when we think scales, we think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When we think chords, we build chords in thirds. So every time we jump a third, the number has to go higher as we go up. So, so we start with a root, we skip over two, we go up a third, then we have one and three. We skip over four and go up another third. So going a third from the third, we get the fifth. From the fifth, we skip over the sixth, we get the seventh. So now we have one, three, five, seven. From the seven, we skip over the octave, which would be eight, and then we get nine. Now nine is synonymous with two meaning it's the same pitch, but we give it a different name when we think in terms of chords that keep going in these thirds. So nine is the same as two. Then from nine, we skip over 10, which isn't an interval. We don't call it 10. We actually skip over the third again, and then we get to the 11th. From the 11th, we skip over what would be 12, but that's really just the fifth. And then we get to 13, which is the same as the sixth scale degree. So in chord talk, 1, 3, 5, 9, 11, 13, if we were looking at those notes as scale tones, it would be 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6. Okay, so why do sometimes we have things called sus2, sus4 versus add 9, add 11? What's the difference there? Well, when the chord has a third in it, if the chord has a third, then in terms of naming conventions, that triadic unit is, is full. One, three, five, that's just a closed triad. That means any other note added to that triad has to happen above the triad. So the two cannot fit because the third is there. So we have to call that two a nine. The fourth can't fit because the third is there. So we have to call that four and 11, right? So it has to be this one. We can't fit it in the triad. This is just naming conventions, right? So when there's a third, we call the second scale degree added to a chord, we call that a nine. If there's a third in the chord, the second, the fourth scale degree, we call that 11. Okay, so why add 11, why add nine? Because we're just adding those notes to the triad. If we had a pure continuity, one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, then in this case, we would call it a D major 11 or a D major nine. But because we don't have a continuity, between the one, three, five, seven, nine, and eleven. These not the nine and eleven, they're kind of isolated. They're not connected with the seven. Therefore, it's add nine, add eleven, because we don't have that seventh in there. So when you see an add nine, add eleven, that means there's no seventh involved. You're just taking the basic triad and you're adding those notes. So that's why I'm calling it add nine, add eleven. Pretty unusual chord, actually, to have these notes all together. And then when to use two and four, that's when there's no third. So if there's no third, 
That triadic space is open then, and we could just go from that three down to a two or up to a four. So if there's no three, we can call scale degree two, two, even if it's a chord, and we could call scale degree four, four, even if it's a chord, because that triadic space is open. Now, this is just in terms of naming conventions. I'm not talking about what you can and can't play. It's just if there's no third in the chord, we call the two a two. If there is a third, we call it a nine. If there's no third in the chord, we call the four a four. If there is a third, we call it an 11. And that, by definition, is a sus chord. So a sus four is root fourth, fifth, and a sus two is root second, fifth. So we hear Chris start. That's the first chord he plays. Like that, right? But then he starts going. Now that right there is reminiscent of the blues. He's really bringing it home right there. Now why is that reminiscent of the blues? Because he's sliding between the minor third and the major third. That's a bluesy thing to do. And you see by the dawn. Think like Johnny Be Good in the same key, but I'll play it up here. So that's that hole. Yeah, so a little bit of bluesiness, right? We have that open spaciousness of this chord but then the bluesiness going from the minor third to the major third. Awesome. Now, what else creates this kind of open feeling? Using power chords for all the other chords. None of the other chords had a third. Now, what's great about the drop D tuning is not only does it facilitate this great open D sound, but it allows us to play power chords with one finger. Oh, and by the way, you might hear me have this phaser effect on. So he definitely had a little bit of phaser going on, which gave it a, a little bit more of a cool warbly kind of a sound. And I looked into Chris Stapleton's pedal board, which he had with him. And sure enough, he's a, a big fan of the stone pedal by Electro Harmonics, I believe, which is a phaser pedal. So I believe he had a little bit of that phaser going on. You know, he had the humbucker, so it was a real warm tone, had that treble rolled off. I'm definitely a little brighter than he was. But anyway, usually a power chord would look like this. Like if my E, if I was tuned, let's say to E, let me just do that real quick. All right, so now I'm in standard E flat. Let's say I wanted to play an A power chord, or in this case, an A flat, because I'm tuned down. I would have to play it like this. Right, index finger on the fifth fret of the sixth string. There's my root A, or in this case, A flat, because I'm tuned down. Then I've got my fifth over two strings down one fret. And then I've got my octave right below that. So that's, you know. That's how we play power chords. But when we tune down, Okay, so now when I want to play that power chord, I just go like this, right? Because being that string is now tuned down a whole step, in order to play the note that was here, now I play it on the same fret as the fifth and the octave. So now I have a three note power chord with one finger. So throughout this whole song, he's playing these power chords with one finger. This is really popular actually even in heavy metal like because you could kind of play a riff with one finger. What you would usually play like this now can become these full power chords. That's a great thing he does and the power chord doesn't have a third so it has this open feeling. The third which makes it major or minor gives it a very powerful kind of pull, but he's keeping things more open by not having that third and just having the root and the fifth. But he does give us this little Hendrixism where he goes, I'm 
calling it a Hendrixism because Hendrix did those, you know, did that a lot, but just a real bluesy thing to do. Hey everybody, thanks for watching so far. So if you want to watch part two, which is another seven minutes, we go into all sorts of other cool stuff using the Fret Live animations, like his modulation to the relative minor chord, B flat minor, his implied secondary dominant chord, the harmonic minor scale, his bluesy use of the power chord built off the minor third of the key at the end of the song, and we also talk a bit more about Chris's overall style. So this is reserved for patrons. The direct link is in the description. If you click on that link and you're not a patron, you could sign up. It's a way that I give thanks to the POW Music patrons for their support of the free content on this YouTube channel. And by becoming a patron, you could get instant access to all of the resources I've ever posted over the last four years for all of my YouTube videos, including downloadable tab PDFs, playable guitar profiles, early sneak peek releases, worksheets, backing tracks, exclusive lessons, and my favorite part, the twice weekly live small group guitar hangout lessons that I've been doing for the past four years, where we all get together of all levels and styles. We learn together, we explore new music, we figure things out by ear, we go more in depth on POW music lessons, and we just jam. We do this three hours a week, two hour and a half sessions, and there's also hundreds of those that you could access and watch because I always post the replay. Also, the thing about watching my content here on YouTube is that from a theory standpoint, it always picks up in some random spot based on the song I'm covering. If you want to understand how music works on the fretboard starting from the very beginning and going sequentially through 12 units, that's why I created the Fret Live Fretboard Mastery Program, which uses the animated fretboard to really show you how to combine all this knowledge from a theory standpoint onto the fretboard and then connect it through songs and through creative activities. So the link to that is in the description. Thank you so much for watching. All right, everybody, happy playing, and I'll see you next time. Before I go, I just want to extend a huge thank you to the following upper tier POW Music patrons. Jason, Shogun7, Nick P, Billy Paps, Pete Elliott, Sean Westfall, Wes Williams, Eric Pelles, Darren Jones, Dr. Ixlin, Andy, Dennis McNulty, Paul Weatherall, Hal Jones, T. Fletch, Dmitry Unkovsky, Greg, Joe, Wayne Evans, Jeff Lambert, Jorge Vaz, Jack Williams, Joe Prangle, L.W., Dave Hubner, Fred Locke, Ruben Garcia, K. Carter, Steve C., Jens Fischer, Joseph Alpert, Mu Jang, Darren, Jonas, Jesse Jacobs, David McPherson, Michael L., Brent Owens, Andrew Gunthart, Jay Brilliant, Jake Martin, William Creighton, Donald James Grass, Chris Freeman, Stephen Pisano, Trampas Thompson, Kent Gresham, John Cushman, Baba Shetty, Derek Mickel, Sean Ellis, Jeff Weatherwax, Boomer Dell, and Joe Fleck. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of the POW Music patrons for helping to make it possible to provide all this free content here on YouTube. Thank you so much. Happy playing. I'll see you next time.